Although three quarters of a million people watched last week's show, we don't have a sponsor this week. I don't know what's wrong with capitalism. Someone could have their name, their brand on the screen with me right now. I could be extolling their virtues. If you know any capitalist with any sense, please let them know that there's a situation vacant. But it allows me to get right on with the show. I mentioned in my introductory menu remarks there that the omnibus of all omnibuses has just passed the US Congress. $1.7 trillion for a year is to be spent by the federal government. Although not many people have read it, including me, who could read it? It's a bill in which all kinds of things are stapled together, including, I think it was five million pounds for uh, the daughter of Dick Cheney, who was famous for having lost her primary election and thus being ejected from Congress last year by a record 40 percentage points. But she's made off with five million dollars, no doubt, to spend on good causes. I'm making my way line by line through the thousand pages and the one, of course, that catches my eye, and the only one of any business of mine, is the military budget. Zelensky is in the White House right now, patted on the head. He's lucky he didn't get his hair sniffed, but then looking at that T-shirt he's always wearing, perhaps nobody would want to sniff him. But Joe Biden patted him on the head and led him in to the White House. I have no doubt that no good can come of it because it's abundantly clear that the war will drag on throughout 2023 and maybe for a very long time after that. It's abundantly clear that we are now in a new hot war period in which at first by proxy uh, the fading, failing Western societies fight the rising societies of the East based on the Eurasian heartland in a fight to the death. If we're not lucky, it'll be your death and mine and our children and the children they never got to have. It's a terrifyingly dangerous prospect, no doubt. Jack Kennedy knew a thing or two about the dangers of East-West nuclear war. That's why he negotiated very successfully an end to the Cuban Missile Crisis, which looked like an existential threat to the existence of the planet 60 years or more ago. Jack Kennedy has not been replaced by better presidents, and the decline is nowhere better summed up than by that picture today of Joe Biden and Zelensky on the White House steps. From Jack Kennedy to Joe Biden is a very long way. And diplomacy is, of course, a thing of the past about which we will teach if we survive our children and our grandchildren, a historical relic. So much so that the, uh, the, the greatest practitioner of realpolitik alive on the planet at 100 years, Henry Kissinger, has just been denounced by the Ukrainian government as a craven appeaser. All he wanted to do was kind of avoid the destruction of the world that, as of natural consequence, he himself will soon be leaving. But the younger generation, people like Joe Biden, have no conception. Maybe he doesn't have any longer the cognitive ability to calculate what the meaning of war, all-out European and then intercontinental war, would look like. I do, alas, as a student of history and a student of war, I see flashpoints all over the globe just waiting to set the torch that will lead to the perhaps final conflagration. I see it in Kosovo right now, where the uh, NATO protectorate, a tiny sliver of what was once the great country of Yugoslavia, which has been seized and is occupied by NATO forces, and the provocations being mounted there by the so-called Kosovan National Authority, which is in fact 
an Albanian satrapy of NATO. The new provocations against the Serbian people have several uh, purposes. The first is obviously the greater Albanian revanchism, which remains virulent in that part of the world. But its main purpose from the standpoint of NATO, who are setting the fuse burning, is to cause further problems for Russia because they know that Russia will never abandon Serbia, never has abandoned Serbia, that Russia will go to war if necessary to protect and defend Serbia. They're doing the same in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, anyone who thinks that Azerbaijan just one day woke up and in a moment of madness decided to launch a war against its neighbor Armenia is a fool or a knave. Most of them, though, are just fools. They're doing it because Russia has a treaty obligation to defend the country of Armenia and will, of course, discharge that responsibility. So a war between Israel and American-backed Azerbaijan and Russian-backed Armenia is another, I don't know, another Ukraine, maybe, they're setting up these fires all over the world. Taiwan is the uh, biggest enchilada of them all. And the continued arming and encouraging of the separatist tendencies in Taiwan, despite the setback of recent elections in which the separatist party was roundly defeated, continue. Australia, New Zealand, Japan, all our old friends are together with the United States and Great Britain in a continuous naval, political, and geostrategic confrontation with the People's Republic of China. So the stage is set. Our grandchildren, if they ever exist, their children, if they ever exist, will be taught we have always been at war with Eurasia, we have always been at war with East Asia. We have always been at war with the foes that we were unable to defeat on the political and economic battlefield. The war goes on, of course, in Africa. I just found a picture, my wife found it actually, of me in Ethiopia, Eritrea in 1985 in the midst of a biblical famine in which the principal cause was war. War stoked, financed and armed by the very same people stoking, arming and financing the conflicts of today. That was 1985. Exactly the same war between exactly the same people is currently being waged in Ethiopia again. And there will be more, much more. The furnace of Libya will erupt again. The ISIS and Al-Qaeda head-chopping fanatics are busy again in Afghanistan. I told you, I warned you all that the day will come when the Taliban will be the moderates in this picture. That's right, the medieval obscurantists of the Taliban will be the moderates in the conflicts to come in Afghanistan. And so, as I'm sorry to say, so often happens, it is coming to pass. The explosion this week where 42 people were killed in a mosque in Afghanistan is merely another bagatelle in what will drag on for many decades to come. And the reason is that Afghanistan kicked out the US occupation army and has replaced its dependence on the US with dependence on China and a little bit of friendship with Russia and a little bit of friendship with Iran. Who would have thunk it? Speaking of Iran, Joe Biden is so out of control of his faculties that apparently unknowingly to a camera, he said yesterday the Iran nuclear deal is dead, but we're not going to announce it. He didn't realize he was 
actually announcing it there and then to somebody who was filming him with a camera. This took place in November, actually. It's taken a while for this footage to emerge. But what does it mean that the Iran nuclear deal is dead? Well, for a start, it means that there are now no barriers or compunctions for Iran to develop a nuclear weapon. If Iran develops a nuclear weapon, so will Saudi Arabia. Then we'll have two religious theocracies with nuclear weapons pointed at each other across the Gulf. What could possibly go wrong? Well done, Joe. Another great achievement. Another lie, of course, because you ran for office on the restoration of the Iran nuclear deal. Another pre-erection promise broken. Speaking of which, Boris Johnson is back in the news. That's Boris Johnson who earned £1.1 million in speaking fees since leaving number 10 Downing Street. Nice work if you can get it. No wonder he in the end decided not to come back. He's in the news tonight calling on everyone in Britain to switch off their festive lights at 8 p.m. this evening in support of the Ukraine. Yes, that's the Boris Johnson who used to ask us to go out on our doorstep at 8 p.m. and applaud an entire nation applauding the very nurses that saved his life in St. Thomas Hospital where my own children were born. Boris Johnson almost lost his life, he says, in that hospital. Is he supporting the nurses? No, just clapping for them back then. No clapping now, only a wage cut for them. With the full support of Boris Johnson and his friends and foes inside the Conservative Party. But it's an odd tactic, switching off your festive lights. First of all, nobody can afford festive lights. I wonder at the people that I drive past who have got festive lights. There's two or three of them round here. I wonder if they're lottery winners or they just don't know what the electric bill for those festive lights is actually going to be. But it's only two or three of them. Festive lights are a thing of the past. Boris, thanks to you and your beloved Ukraine. Our people can't afford, never mind festive lights, our people can't afford to stay warm. It's a bit milder this evening, but in the last seven days, where temperatures were up to 10 degrees below zero, all over this country, homeless people, were freezing to death on the streets. Our old age pensioners were freezing in their houses with quilts, duvets wrapped around them in their living room with bubble hats and cardigans by the dozen around them and on their feet. Our poor people were having to choose between heating their families and feeding their families. All thanks to you, Boris Johnson, Macron, little soldier Schultz, and all the other dwarves who are so dwarfish I don't even know their names, and neither do you. Who's the head of the Netherlands? Anybody, any idea? What I do know is that the Netherlands has the highest inflation rate in Europe right now. Why? Because the Netherlands decided they wanted to be Russia's biggest enemy in Europe right now. So their people are suffering an inflation rate, not of double digits, but of 20% and more. They have no oil or gas or electricity 
to spare. They can't afford to buy the power that they do have in supply. Why? Because this unknown dwarf that runs the Netherlands decided that he was going to make Putin suffer. But of course, Putin isn't suffering. Apart from all those ailments that he's got that are going to kill him in the next uh, 25 minutes, I think, is all the life he has left to him. He's got cancer of everywhere. He's got uh, heart problems. He's had strokes. He's paralyzed. Have you not seen the pictures of his left arm? He's limping. Look as he goes across the floor to meet Lukashenko. All these sheep out there that buy all this stuff, all these sheep that are remaining, shivering, hungry, unemployed, poor in their houses while their own governments destroy their own economies. Not for the first time either over the last couple of years. First it was COVID, then it was Ukraine. Next it will be Taiwan. The next thing, the sheep follow the sheepdog. One sheepdog is all that is required to herd a vast flock of sheep onto the trucks on the way to the slaughterhouse. It's a dismal picture, to be sure, but not as dismal as the picture in the Ukraine itself. Ukraine is winning, don't you know? 80% of Kiev has no water. 80% of Kiev has no electricity. 25% of the people of the entire Ukraine have no electricity. Every day, all day, their electricity and energy infrastructure is systematically destroyed and the missiles coming in to do it cannot be defended against. Ukraine has lost 25% of its territory, 22% of its population, not counting the millions of Ukrainians that have already left the country and will never return. You think Kosovans demanding the right to wipe your windscreen is the biggest problem you're going to have from NATO wars in Europe? You ain't seen nothing yet because these millions of Ukrainians will be like the Kosovans before them, the principal source of people trafficking of illegal weapons, illegal drugs, and illegal people trafficking, most of it for the purposes of vice. Hey, Merry Christmas! Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night.